Hello, this is Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, and welcome to the Global Classroom. Quick question, can you define the terms good debt versus bad debt, and is there a difference? Well, according to a variety of financial outlets such as Smart Money and Fidelity and Investments, there is a difference. There's a huge difference. And before I go any further, here's my public service announcement disclaimer. Debt is debt, period, and it always comes with risk attached. In general, a good debt increases your net worth and generates value or future income. Case in point, a mortgage is classified as a good debt. Why? Because it can increase your net worth over time and generate future income. Home equity is the number one generator of net worth. According to the Census Bureau, nearly two thirds of Americans have equity in a home with a median value of about $150,000. But unfortunately, less than 44% of African Americans own a home. Conversely, while student loans can be a financial burden, taking on debt to pay for education is generally considered a good debt. Data quickly points out that the typical college graduate earns about $500 more per week or $26,000 a year than the average high school grad. College grads generally encounter lower rates of unemployment, which also adds to lifetime earnings. And that's why some consider student loans as an investment in your future. And last but not least, borrowing to invest in a small business or real estate is also considered good debt because you are investing in an asset that will improve your overall financial picture. Now let's look at the other side of the ledger. Bad debt is used to finance purchases that will depreciate without you ever increasing your net worth. In some cases, due to high interest rates, you'll likely end up paying a premium for purchases that won't add anything to your value over time. Credit card debt and high interest personal loans, specifically payday loans, are on top of the list. Once you realize that the average American owes more than $6,000 in credit card debt, you will soon realize that credit cards make spending easy, but often create pain later. Now you're probably wondering why I'm taking a deep dive on the subject of good debt versus bad debt. Simple, our nation is currently in the middle of a debt ceiling crisis that resembles the average family budget, in this case, a national $31 trillion budget. A nationwide checkbook where the average U.S. family earns $48,000 a year but spends $59,000 a year and finances the difference with credit cards. So again, I ask you, what is Washington, D.C.'s plan to return to financial solvency? How will Washington balance its books? Well, unfortunately, by implementing a potpourri of strategies that will inadvertently affect African Americans, such as increasing interest rates and scaling back on programs to HBCUs and the like and trimming costs to a safety net that we rely on. But here's the good news. Every room has a door, every door has a key, and every problem has a solution. Here is a way out. Here is a way for you to fortify your financial position, create wealth, and to hold on to your earnings. It's time for each of us individually to refocus financially. And once you understand how to hold on to your economic power in the form of spending, saving, and investing, your focus shifts. Where your focus goes, energy flows. We've got to reinvest. We've got to invest in the rudiments of money. How to make it, keep it, share it, and open our hands to it by applying three simple keys. Step one, managing your finances is your responsibility. Your greatest investment will always be in yourself. And once you invest in yourself, no, you will never be poor. Become a student of the money game. Read, study, grow, and develop. Prosperity does not dictate what you should do, but it does demand that you do something. There is a power in you greater than poverty, greater than the lack of education. But you can never reach higher than your level of thought and belief. And by controlling your thought, not only will you transform your life, and your financial condition, but you will begin to impact the lives around you. So don't give your power away. Establish a budget, live within it, and continually expand your level of financial awareness. Step number two, get your spending under control. Separate needs from wants. 
The vice of our age is the desire to keep up with the Joneses, to outshine our neighbor. Well, I'm here to tell you it's time to let your neighbor go. How many credit cards do you own? Count the number of credit cards on your wallet, excluding debit cards. If you carry more than one credit card, then you're probably overspending and incurring debt. Debt is the enemy of wealth and financial independence. By spending tomorrow's money today, you're giving up any chance of financial freedom. There's nothing easy about easy payments. Each time you pay off a credit card with 15% interest, you're giving yourself 15% return on your money. Make this the year that you finally retire credit card debt. And step number three, saving and investing. Make your money work as hard as you do. All great fortunes have their foundation in the first great principle of wealth building, and that is saving. Create and adhere to a savings plan. The saving of money translates into the saving of the individual. Don't settle for less than what you can be financially. You see, by the mysterious power of compound interest, little becomes much and much becomes more. Why? Because money goes where it's treated best. So don't wait for Uncle Sam to clamp down. Beat him to the punch. Money doesn't talk, it screams. Well, until next time, this is Dr. Dennis Kimbrough in the Global Classroom. And remember, your wealth choice is your best choice. God bless.